primary text that we're going to be looking at this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Uh, If you would please stand for the reading of God's word as you're opening your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament. You have the Gospels, and then you have uh, the book of of Acts and Romans, uh, and then Paul's first letter to the Corinthians immediately following after that. So we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 beginning in verse 12. We stand out of honor and reverence for God. It's our conviction that the Bible is the Word of God. And so when we read the Word of God publicly, we stand to acknowledge the holiness and the sovereignty of God in giving us this Word. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. We are all a single member. Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Would you please be seated as we pray together? God, as we gather here and unite our hearts in worship, it is our hope that as we look into the truth of your word and we see the spirit move through the proclamation of your word to illuminate the truth of the text in our hearts god that that over time as we hear your word proclaimed that we would desire what you desire and god we know that what you desire is unity in your church god i pray that we would desire that same unity God, we do pray that your spirit would move through the proclamation of this word, that you would help us to understand its meaning as you intended it, that you would help us to apply it in our lives in a way that would give glory to you and be beneficial to us and even build up your church, which is the body of Christ. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a situation where you, you just didn't really feel like you belonged? You ever been in a situation where you just felt totally out of place? Like for one reason or another, you, you just had this feeling like you didn't belong there. You didn't fit in. It, it's an interesting thing. Our, our desire to fit in, our, our desire to to belong, and, and in my experience, it really doesn't matter whether you're 14 or you're 44, it, it's a very uncomfortable feeling to, to be in a situation where you are e- either made to feel or for something inside of you, you, you just do feel like you don't belong there, like you don't fit in, you're an outsider or an outcast of sorts. I think oftentimes we feel this way because we think we're different somehow. 
This feeling was really put in, in concrete for me uh, a number of years ago. My wife and I were serving uh, a church in Colorado Springs, and uh, one, of my, one of my closest friends in the church uh, was in the Army. He served at Fort Carson there in Colorado Springs, and he was uh, in Special Forces, and he became a, a great friend, was a, a very faithful youth worker, and uh, just a, an awesome guy. And one, one year, uh, a couple days before Labor Day, he invited us to his home for uh, a Labor Day picnic, just a gathering. He said, we're, we're just going to have some friends over. We'd like for you and your wife to come and join us. We're just going to relax and cook out and hang out and have a good time. So we uh, went to this Labor Day picnic, and we were just there to relax and have uh, a good time. But I realized very quickly upon arriving at this Labor Day picnic that I didn't fit in at all. What my buddy failed to tell me is that this picnic was his unit of special forces, Green Berets, and me. Not only was I the only non-military, the only non-Green Beret at this party, they were deploying the next day uh, to the Middle East. And so I instantly felt like, man, I do not belong in this setting. I, I, I expected something when I sort of found out a little bit more about the setting and, and, and my expectation uh, was that, that I, I was just not going to fit in. I thought, man, I don't have anything to talk to these guys about. These guys jump out of airplanes and fight bad guys for their job, and I play ping pong and hang out in coffee shops. <laughs> I think the reason that, that I didn't fit in is I, I just felt like, man, I'm totally different from these guys. Our, our worlds are totally different. But the truly interesting thing for me was that as the day continued, what I began to realize is that all of these men were extremely different from one another. I, I sort of had this expectation, and I expected that I was going to go to this, this barbecue, this picnic, and uh, these guys were all going to be these gung-ho, hardcore, you know, Sergeant Slaughter type of guys, and I knew they were deploying the next day. I thought, this is just going to be like a, a, a pep rally. They're going to be like a bunch of high school guys about to play in the state championship, and they're going to be hyping each other up. And I thought, man, I just have nothing to contribute. I, I thought I was walking into this situation that, that I wasn't going to be able to relate to at all, but the more I hung out with these guys, I, I began to realize how this unit functioned. My, my buddy who invited me was the commander of the unit. He, he, was the, he was the boss. He was in charge. He was extremely intelligent, very calm, very level-headed. It was his job to keep everybody else on mission, even as things were going haywire around them. It was his job to remain calm and to help everybody stay focused. And so he was like the most calm, sort of soothing, relaxing guy you can imagine. Start talking to these guys and hanging out. There's another guy on this team who was a language expert. He, he spoke like seven languages fluently, and the, his, his role on the team was sort of like no matter where these guys would find themselves in the world, it, it was highly likely that he was going to be able to find someone that he could communicate with and sort of talk with. There was another guy on the team who was a communications expert of, of radio and having maintaining communication back with, with command and so that these people could talk to each other. There's another guy on the team who was uh, a medic. And I, and I begin to understand that on this team, the, the strength was actually in their diversity. The, the fact that they all understood that though there's one common objective for this team, they all play a very unique and very different role on the team. And I became fascinated with just sort of hanging out with these guys and talking to them and finding out what's, what's your area of expertise, what do you contribute, what's your role, what do you do? And, and I began to realize that it was actually their diversity which made them more effective and, and more unified. I think it's a similar idea of what Paul is trying to convey in the passage that we're looking at this morning. And Paul says there actually is tremendous diversity among the members of the body 
of Christ. Look with me at verses 12 through 14, these introductory verses of the passage that we're looking at this morning. He's talking about the issue specifically of of spiritual gifts in this church in Corinth. There began to be great division over the exercise of spiritual gifts. And there was a a great division which had arisen in the church where they were sort of elevating some of the gifts above other gifts. And they were meant to believe as the uh, members of this body of the church in Corinth that people who possessed a certain spiritual gift had a sort of higher level of importance and they were uh, of greater prominence and they should be elevated and people who maybe didn't have that same spiritual gift or had what the church had considered to be a, a lesser spiritual gift were sort of cast aside as if their contribution to the body was less important. And so Paul is writing this passage to try to help the church understand that the Spirit has gifted each one of us differently, and it's all for the glory of God in the body of Christ. He says this in verse 12, Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the same spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And I've heard this statement a lot, and this certainly is a true statement for me. And and, and maybe some of you have been around long enough to remember when this wasn't true. But in my lifetime, I, I have never seen our country more divided. I'm, I'm 44, and as I think back to uh, my growing up, my childhood experience in the 80s and my teenage years in the 90s and my uh, early uh, adulthood in the early 2000s, I, I can't remember a time when we as a nation were more divided. And what's sad is I think it's sort of spilling into the church. E- even the church as, this, as a global entity and the, the, the church here in America is is more divided over things that that, that aren't central to the gospel than any time I can ever imagine. And and even in our own church, I'm just going to be honest, I, I think that there's the real potential in this season for us to allow, if we will let it, division to creep into the church. Division over issues of personal protection, issues of whether we should wear masks or not wear masks and we're we're even divided even among us on this issue it's amazing that as we see all of the advancements that we have in communication and technology it's also true that there's never been a time in my lifetime when we have been more connected as a people but we are also simultaneously more divided than we've ever been. We have the ability within seconds to get on social media and find out what's going on in California and in New York and in China and Japan and New Zealand. All over the world, we have the opportunity to get online and within seconds know exactly what's going on in this place, these places. And you would think that having greater connectivity would make us uh, or cause us to have greater unity, but the, reaction, the reality is that's not the case. And I think the reason that we have more disunity now than we have ever had, perhaps, in, in, in our nation's history, certainly in my time here, is that we as a nation, are, and even as a church, are, are looking for unity in things which don't have the capacity to unite us. But we think that we can find unity in education or that we can find unity in science or that we can find unity in a political party. And we've even begun to think that we can find unity by erasing free speech and requiring everyone to speak in a way that's more universally acceptable. And the reality is that this world is under the control of the enemy. And the enemy only has a couple of stated objectives. John 10.10, 10, it says that the enemy, his desire is, is to steal and to kill and to destroy. The world is under the control of one whose stated objective is to bring division. 
It's the goal of the enemy. The enemy wants to divide. The enemy wants sin to divide friends from one another. He wants sin to divide neighbors. The enemy wants to divide families. Ultimately, the enemy wants to prevent there from being unity between God and man. It's the enemy's objective to divide us. And the reality is that there is only one thing which can truly unite us. It's the gospel. It's really, truly remarkable what Paul says in the opening passages uh, of this, uh, the opening verses of this passage that we're looking at this morning. He, He says that just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. Paul says the church, the body of Christ, as we gather together to worship our head, who is Jesus Christ, we are in a very real way like the human body. A gathering together of multiple organs and, 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 and multiple body parts, but they're all functioning to support uh, the, the worship of our head, who is Jesus Christ. Verse 13, he says, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Did you know, church, when you were baptized, you were baptized into the body of Christ. You were baptized as a a member of the church globally. That there is this real connectivity in Christ with all believers who are gathering on the planet That's why uh, even this morning in in the prayer that I prayed, I think that we need to be earnestly seeking God for the wisdom for the church leaders in places where just gathering in worship has become very, very difficult. These are difficult decisions. The two churches that I prayed for specifically this morning are huge churches with huge staffs and huge followings and huge budgets. And so they're the ones that are in the crosshairs of this this issue of does the, does the state have the right, even in the, in the face of a, of a pandemic, to prevent the church from gathering? And the ch- two churches that we lifted up in prayer are churches which are, which are sort of in the crosshairs, but the reality is that the two churches that I mentioned have the resources to take on this fight. There are hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of small churches this morning that aren't gathering because they don't have a legal team. They don't have the the, the resources to be able to take on the state. They don't have the capacity to, to, to spend weeks and months in court litigating this thing out. Our hearts ought to be united with them and praying for them for wisdom because we are united with them. And Paul says you're, you're baptized into one body. It's the global body of Christ, the universal church. But the way that we live out our relationship with the global body of Christ is through this local gathering of people who gather together to worship Jesus Christ. It's through the local church that we participate in the body of Christ. And this picture that Paul paints of the church, which is gathered in Corinth is, is, is not really any less true of us. He says we're gathered in, in one spirit, Jews and Greeks and slaves and free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, though we come from vastly different situations, different ethnicities even, different social and economic situations. But we gather together as those who have one spirit, the spirit of God, which has indwelt all of us who have believed in Jesus Christ. And so we can gather in unity, putting all of our differences aside and gathering together in worship to say none of the things which would divide us in this world are true of us as we gather as God's people in worship. None of those things matter for us. Not ethnic divisions, not national divisions, not economic divisions, not social divisions. None of those things matter. All of those things are intended to melt away as we gather as a body of people who are unified in Christ. 
This isn't possible anywhere else outside the church. It's only in God's economy that people from all different walks of life, all different ethnicities, all different social statuses, all different economic situations can gather and be truly unified in Christ. That, that is the unique contribution of the church to the world. And when we begin to divide ourselves or to allow ourselves to be divided over the very things which divide the world, we actually lose our voice to speak what God has given us to speak into the culture. The reality is this, we need each other. I, I think we've lost that sense as the American church. The reality is this, the church exists to worship God, but the church exists because we need each other. The, the scriptures paint this picture of Christians who are walking out their faith in this life. And, and it says about us that we are aliens. We are strangers here. We are sojourning. We are sort of wandering through a land and a world in a time which does not belong to us and we don't belong to it. Our citizenship is not of this world. Our, our truest identity is not Americans or Oklahomans or Piedmontians or whatever we're called. Our, our truest identity is that we are in Christ. And as we're walking through this world, which the scripture says over and over and over, is going to be hostile to you. As Jesus was sending people out into the world, he said, listen, don't be surprised when the world hates you. You need to understand that they hated me first. They're going to hate you. Expect that they're going to hate you. Expect that you're going to be despised. Expect that you're going to be ridiculed. Expect that life in this world is going to be hard because we identify with Christ who was murdered on a cross, who was rejected. We need each other. And Paul goes on to say in verse uh, 15, he says, if the, if the foot should say, because I'm not the hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If, if the ear should say, because I, I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. The whole, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? He, he continues on with this idea using parts of the body as metaphors to help us understand this one central truth. And church, we need to hear this. We gather together because we need each other. We are dependent on each other. That's why membership in a, in a local body of believers, a gathered church is, is important because I need to be able to know when things in life are difficult. And, and listen, things in life are, are always going to be difficult. There's only two seasons for the Christian in this life. You're either in the storm or you're preparing for the next storm because this world is fallen. This world is controlled by chaos and by sickness and by disease and by death and by division and by corruption. There's only two seasons for us as Christians. We're either in the storm or we're preparing for the storm. And we need each other. And we gather here out of that very real sense that tomorrow we're going to go back into this world which is controlled by the enemy and, and we need each other. We need the church because we need to know who we can call on when we are in the midst of the storm. So Paul uses this sort of graphic illustration to show us that the eye needs the ear and the head needs the feet in the body. There, there is not one organ, one entity, one limb, one digit, which is unnecessary. We need each other. We depend each other. And the reality is, for most of you in this room, you can think upon very specific times in your life where this was absolutely true for you. You know, I remember for Jennifer and I, right after the twins were born, 
There, there was like a two-year blur in, in my memory where everything is just sort of hazy. You know, I've, I've told the story before, and I, and I won't tell it in great detail, but uh, the reality is we went to uh, the doctor for what we thought was kind of a routine appointment, and we were still uh, four, five, six weeks away uh, from the due date, and the doctor tells us on a Thursday there's something wrong and we need to take these babies tomorrow, be here tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. And so we thought we sort of had another month to prepare, and they're like, no, they're coming tomorrow. And so we go and they take Abby and Kate, and, and they were both having uh, medical issues. They were both underweight, but, you know, by God's grace, after uh, a stint in the NICU, they sent us home with these two tiny, like four-pound babies, and, and they sent us home with these instructions. I, I remember the, the nurse in the NICU saying to me as we, we left, she said, you've got to fight for every calorie you can get in these babies. They've got to grow. They were having trouble growing, and, and our whole lives were consumed literally with feeding two four-pound babies. And everything else just was sort of a, a blur for us. It was like a constant 23-and-a-half-hour-a-day routine of preparing bottles and washing bottles and, and all that had to be done because we really felt like we are fighting for these babies to gain weight so that they can sustain life. And I remember during that season, our church just coming around us. People just showed up. And, and I used to be bashful about asking for help. People just showed up and they're like, just give us all of your laundry and we'll take it and we'll wash it and we'll dry it and we'll bring it back. And there were people who just showed up to just mow our grass and bring us food and do our laundry. And, and on Sunday mornings, it was, it was during flu season that the babies were born and they didn't want the babies going to church for like six or eight weeks. There were ladies who would come every Sunday morning for an hour and a half just to hold the babies so that Jennifer could go to church and gather with the church family because we understood that we need each other. We need the church. During that season, our, our dryer just went completely kaput, and we didn't have money, let alone time, to go look for another dryer. Someone shows up with their, in their truck with a brand new dryer. Just, they just heard about it and went and bought us a brand new dryer and came and hooked it up so that we could sort of function. And listen, I, I've been so encouraged, even in my year here, about hearing the way that this church has cared for many of you in that same capacity. Even just this weekend, Hearing the stories uh, uh, from members of this church about even in the difficult times of this church, that they knew that they were loved and cared for and provided for by this body of believers. Paul paints this picture of unity within the body of Christ that we need to be reminded of that we need the church. We need each other just as the eye needs the ear or the head needs the foot, we gather together as the body of Christ at First Baptist Church in Piedmont, Oklahoma, because we need each other. That's why I've been so burdened during this season. There's a whole segment of people that for legitimate reasons are not gathering with us. And I want to speak to those of you who are watching right now on the computer and have been faithfully gathering together with us in your living room. To, we want to let you know that we, we need you. It's not just for us that we need the church. We, we need each other. It's why the season has been so difficult it's why we've made the decision as a family that we're going to wear masks as, uh, uh, to church. N not because I'm trying to make a political statement uh, uh, about, about the effectiveness of masks. It's not because I've done all the research in the world and I have concluded that masks are the end-all, be-all to ending this. I don't, I don't know. The reality is this. You could talk to a dozen different scientists and get at least a dozen different responses about the effectiveness of masks. But here's what I've come to believe and to resolve in my own heart. 
that, that if me wearing a mask will help other people feel more comfortable to gather with us on Sunday morning, then it's worth me wearing a mask, whether it works or not. Because we need each other. We need those members, especially those older saints who are fearful to gather with us because of this virus. We need them speaking truth into our lives. We need their wisdom. We need their presence. We are dependent on one another. It's why we long to be together. The world can't understand why the church is reacting the way that it is. They think, well, why do you need the building? Well, why is it so important for you to, to, to meet in the, in, in the building? And why are you so connected to the building? Isn't the church the body of Christ? Yes, it is the body of Christ. But the reality is we need each other. We need to gather together and worship. So we need each other. As the body, we need each individual member. We believe that God in his sovereign control of everything has orchestrated this body of believers here in Piedmont for his specific purposes. And so when one of our members is absent, consistently absent, or one of our members is unable to meet with us, it's not just that there's an empty seat. It's that, it's that the body is not functioning as it should be or could be. The body needs its individual members, but the reality is this, that the individual members also need the body. The book of Hebrews talks about the importance of gathering together. In Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19, the author of Hebrews says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And Paul says we, we need to meet because the body needs its individual members, but we also need to meet because the individual members need the body. We need to be built up into Christ. We need to be encouraged. We need to gather together to encourage one another, to sing songs and, and hymns and, and spiritual songs together, to encourage one another, to be built up into the body. And he says, this is all the more true as you see the day drawing near, as you see the, the world changing around you. And I would argue that there's never been a time in our American experience when we needed the church more than we do right now as we see the culture continue to drift further and further and further away from the truth of the gospel. It's even more imperative right now that we have each other, that we depend on each other, that we look forward to gathering together with one another because we need the body and the body needs us. That's why Paul tells us. He desires, verse 25, that there would be no division in the body. The members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, it's amazing how the smallest body part can make you absolutely miserable. You ever get like a, an, an ingrown toenail? Think about how can, how can one toe so significantly affect my entire body? You have a toothache. One little tooth. The bad tooth, it can make you absolutely miserable. It's because we understand in our bodies that there is this connectivity. That when one of us suffers in our body, our, our whole body suffers. And Paul's calling us to unity in the church. He's calling us 
to understand that in God's economy, that we need the body, and the body needs us. I think we've lost that. You know, it's interesting when you speak with Christians who are trying to walk out faith in countries where there is real and heavy persecution. This is not a concept that they struggle with. I think a lot of times we, we look at Christians in other places, we think of communist China where right now they are systematically dismantling the Christian church in, in communist China. And, and, and we look at those Christians and we think, man, it's crazy that they're risking their lives to go and gather to, to be together. There is very real threat of violence that, that just for, for gathering together. Why, 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 why are they doing that? Why wouldn't they just sort of gather in their homes and read their family, read their Bible together as their family and have quiet time and devotion? And why, why wouldn't they just sort of acquiesce to what the government wants and just sort of withdraw to their houses? The reality is this, they understand this passage in a very real way, that they need each other. I believe the same truth is going to be our future reality. The interesting thing is, if you talk to the churches and, and listen to church leaders in California and Nevada, those church leaders who have made the difficult decision to defy the government and meet, their churches are busting at the seams. Because all of the sudden, there's this strange effect on Christians in California and Nevada where all it took was the government saying you're not able to meet for them to realize we need to meet. This is what God intended. As we think about membership in our own church, as we see things happening in California and Nevada, which only a few years ago we would have thought were unthinkable. The reality is that we're not promised the security that we have today. My prayer and my hope is that our hearts, like the hearts of our brothers and sisters in places like Russia and China and Indonesia and in the Middle East and in North Africa, that our hearts would be like the hearts of even our brothers and sisters in California and Nevada, that we would come to an understanding that as aliens and strangers and sojourners in this land, as we're trying to walk out our faith and live in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called in Jesus Christ, that we need the church. We need each other. We're dependent on the church, and the church is dependent on us. As, as we think about sort of moving to this, uh, what, what is for us a little bit of a paradigm shift, moving away from a system where people just walk down the aisle and without them knowing who we are or we knowing who them are, we affirm them as membership or as members. And, and, and we think about embracing uh, a, a membership process of people going through a class to find out who we are as a church, what we affirm as a church, and for us to find out what's going on in people's lives, and for us as a church to vote on receiving members in a real meaningful way, having uh, w with a full understanding of, of who we are. I, I think it only grows in us a, a heightened sense of awareness that we need one another. And that membership in the local body ought to mean something. Membership historically has been thought of as a covenant. It, this isn't a country club where you pay a due and, and as long as you pay your dues, you get to be a member of the country club. Church membership has been thought of historically as a covenant. That members are covenanting together to, to be what God has called them to be and do what God has called them to do. And we need each other both for accountability and for, for our own spiritual growth. Membership matters. 
means that we are no longer identifying as those whose truest identity is Americans, Oklahomans, citizens of Piedmont, but that we recognize that we are aliens, strangers, sojourners, that our eternal citizenship is our truest citizenship, and we need each other. I hope that through this process, your knowledge and understanding of what we believe and what we as a, a church affirm has only been, uh, been raised so that people who are, who are coming and thinking about uniting with us in, in membership might understand this is important. It's not just a club that we join. It's a covenant that we are committing to because we understand that we need the church and the church needs us in a very real way. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you for this church. God, I thank you for the, the many ways that I have seen this church minister to its individuals uh, over the course of my time here. And I thank you for the very ways that I see so many of the members of this body sacrificially giving of themselves for the sake of the body, God. I thank you for the many people who understand this reality that we need each other. We are fully spiritually dependent on one another. God, we thank you that it is the gospel which unites us. It's our common belief that Jesus Christ died to save sinners, that he died to save us. And there's those people who understand that our, our identity is, is hidden with Christ. It's no longer us who lives, but it's Christ who lives in us. We, we understand, Lord, that we need the church. That we're dependent on one another. God, my heart does break for those members who have been unable to meet with us now for so many months. I, I have talked, God, to so many people who, who ne never missed a Sunday for 40 or 50 or 60 years. Some of the most, most faithful saints that, that you have in your church, God, who they for the last five or six months now have been unable to meet and so our heart our heart breaks for them God and we 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 pray Lord for an end to the virus we pray Lord for whatever would need to happen so that our body could fully function together in the way that we were intended to God we lift up those saints that we are missing in a very real way and who we know are missing us God I, I pray that as we continue to to boldly contend for the truth of your word, that you would continue to build up this body. God, that the way that this body gets more healthy is that our individual members get more healthy. As we learn, God, more fully to turn from all of the things of this world and trust only in Christ who offered himself as a ransom so that we who only knew division can now know perfect unity with God through Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you uh, this morning. As we do every week, it's our conviction that every time the Word of God is proclaimed, that God's people should respond. Maybe you need to respond by coming forward. Maybe you do want to unite with this church and membership. We would love to have that conversation with you. Maybe you want to come forward and, and trust Christ. Maybe you're sitting there and you've never responded to the gospel by turning from sin and trusting in Christ. We would love to talk to you about what it means and what it looks like to give your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to come forward and talk about uh, becoming obedient in baptism. You've believed on Jesus Christ and you've turned from your sin, but you've not 
been baptized, we'd love to have that conversation or whatever the Lord has placed on your heart. It's our conviction that every single one of us should respond when the word of God is proclaimed. But you don't have to come forward to do that. We would love for you to. Maybe you need to respond where you are by confessing to the Lord a sinful attitude of independence from the church. Maybe, maybe you have not viewed the church as uh, essential. Maybe you've not viewed the church as necessary and you've failed to understand that, that you need the body and that the body needs you. And maybe you need to just respond by turning from that sin. And I, I don't know what the, the, the Spirit is, is calling upon you to, to respond by doing this morning, but I know that He's calling all of us to respond. So let's stand together and respond in song as we sing together.